All right, cool. Well, thanks for, for having me. And uh, thanks for, for inviting me, Rodrigo, to, to, this, to this event. Um, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm sorry I missed the first day, but it's, it's very exciting to see the Japanese and Chilean collaboration. We are actually in Australia, um, so I'm, I'm glad we snuck in here. And, and I'm going to give a bit of a presentation of what we do at Lyra Robotics. We are a pretty young company. We are, um, you know, not the 120 year old company as the previous presentation, but a young startup. And we're trying to see how we can use the robotic systems that we have developed to really help out in the food supply chain and particularly how we can do robotic packing in the food supply chain. So I'm Yuxi Leitner, I'm the co-founder and managing director here at Lyra Robotics. And as mentioned before, we are spin out from the Australian Center for Robotic Vision. If you have any questions, feel free to just pop something in the chat um, or raise your hand. Um, I'm more than happy to take the questions during the presentation and I like it if it's interactive. So feel free to, to jump in and, and let me know if there's any specific questions that you do have. So Lyra Robotics was started in 2019. It is a spin out from the Australian Center for Robotic Vision, which by itself was a seven year long-term research initiative here in Australia funded by the government, four universities in Australia, and a few international partners really working together to bring computer vision and machine learning back to robotics. Like in, in the 50s and 60s, when robotics sort of took off uh, in the last century, these things were very tightly connected. You had you know, computer vision, very much a core idea of robotic systems. But over the last couple of decades, they sort of diverged a bit. And so the idea behind the center was, can we create robotic systems that see, robotic systems that understand the scene around them by visually identifying objects in the world. And so that included developing of sensors, developing of computer vision algorithms, but also developing of robotic systems to then use that information to perform actions in the space. And more specifically, I was research lead for robotic manipulation. So everything that has to do with can a robotic system pick up an object, manipulate an object, place an object, and understand even what an object is and how to pick it up in the first place. So I'm based here in Brisbane at, uh, and I'm still affiliated with QUT. But in 2019, we created Lyra. And Lyra is really trying to bring the brain, the eye, and eyes and the hands together into a product that, for example, as you can see here in our very first prototype, pick mangoes uh, off a belt and pack them in a pattern in a box as needed. And the core idea for Lyro is really to free people from the need to perform dirty, dull and dangerous tasks. And that is not just in the food supply chain, although we're obviously very interested for the food supply chain. This is really a problem across the whole uh, logistics and supply chains, whether that is in manufacturing, waste management, or the food supply chain like agriculture and horticulture. And our, really our goal is to bring thousands, and in fact, 100,000 robots by the end of the decade out there to perform these tasks, because just a few robotic systems are not going to make a difference. Right? I've, I've been in academia for a while and enjoy building proof of concept robots. But really with Lyra, the goal is to take that the next step further and really deploy a lot of robots out there. As mentioned also you know, in the previous presentation, labor shortage is, is a problem across you know, a lot of countries, not just in Japan, not just in Australia, but it's, it's really a problem across a lot of countries. And we need to think how we can make these systems and these processes smarter so we can actually deliver the produce and the items that we want to the customers that are in need of them. And right now in Australia, there's a massive challenge about that. And that's really sort of why we, we started this, this spin out company and focus on agriculture right now. There's 26,000 jobs right now missing. Right now, we don't have 26,000 people that otherwise would be working right now in the food supply chain. And that is massive, right? That's a lot of you know, workforce that is currently not existing. At the same time, this is not just a, you know, it will go away once COVID is going away. The trend before that was already like, you know, increasing of, of labor shortages and stuff uh, like no contact packing will stay around because consumers want the certainty and the traceability to understand where the produce was picked and packed. And adjacent to that, we also see this massive increase, um, like this massive step change over the last 
12 months in e-commerce and that is e-commerce also in in food and e-grocery which is really a sort of an interesting new challenge that sort of didn't really exist a couple of years ago and so all that comes together and there's this critical point right now where we really need thousands of robots out there to help out obviously we can't just you know deploy a thousand robots like tomorrow um, we, we got a lot of phone calls, uh, especially during the pandemic from, from farmers in, in deploying robotic systems, but also in the logistics area. But it's, uh, it's definitely a need out there. And that really sort of drove the ideas that you know, made Lyro into a company. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the focus of the last uh, 12 months was really on pattern packing for, for the food supply chain. We believe that Post-harvest is currently one of the biggest gaps where there's no robotic automation in even research and where there's no solution out there. So we developed and designed and also deployed recently the world's first fresh produce pattern packing robotic system. And that sounds like a lot of words smashed together, but what that actually means is we build a robotic system that is not a machine specifically used for one produce and one item, but it actually can pick up avocados, it can pick up mangoes, it can pick up lemon, lime, chili. Uh, we packed uh, stone fruit, we packed nectarines, we packed uh, mandarins, we packed uh, quite literally almost everything that you can think of. And that is really the core idea here. It's a robotic system. It's not a machine that does one thing for one item, but actually a robotic system that is quickly deployable and changeable from one system to the next one. So this is uh, a video where we're packing mangoes. As I said, uh, before that we packed avocados and this was actually one of our very first deployments. We can see that we actually retrofitting a packing shed operation. So this is in the packing house after the fruit has been harvested, after it's been washed. Uh, you can see some of the ladies there in the background actually performing the same task as our robotic system, which is to pick up the avocados and put them in the box. The difference is actually the ladies in the back are not actually placing them in a pattern. They're just filling them up to weight. That's a different grade of avocados. And we are packing them in a specific pattern, as you can see also in a nice picture that is sort of on the right in, right in the back. So what is really the core value proposition here? It is for the farmer and the grower, as well as the packing shed operator, how can we help them improve the throughput? That is the biggest issue right now because they're relying heavily on transient labor. So that's labor forces that are coming in to do a certain amount of job, whether that's uh, on a work and travel visa or uh, even you know, Pacific Islanders uh, that are basically flown in just to perform this job. And right now that, that is not happening. And so we've seen a significant increase in food wastage, so the wastage of produce that is going through a supply chain is minimized. It puts extreme stress on the food supply chain, whether that is for domestic use or for export. And that actually leads to increased produce prices when you go to the supermarket and try to buy your fresh produce. And that is really something that you know, is broadly seen here. So we, we can clearly see that there's a pressure point on there and we want to, to help uh, the growers and the farmers overcome a lot of the uncertainty that currently is uh, kind of stemming from, from that lack of a labor force. But also we don't want them to change how they operate. Uh, in the past, when whenever mechanized solution came into packing operations, they are required to restructure their system. And it's kind of like robotics in, in, in industry and, and manufacturing, maybe like 30 years ago, when you built a whole factory around the capabilities of the robotic system which means that you actually have a lot of capital expenditure. You have to you know, redesign a lot of things. You need a lot of contractors to come in. What we want to do and what we designed our robotic system for is that it's plug and play. Quite literally, we can roll in the robotic system and it takes us less than an hour to activate the robotic system, tweak everything, fine tune everything and start packing. So in the case of the avocados that you've seen before, it took us 45 minutes from parking our car to packing avocados with our robotic system. At the same time, we also want to quickly be able to change from, from one produce to the next. And that is highly important because we've seen a lot of uh, interest to bring more and more farmers and more and more growers together to build packing operations that actually can last longer than one season would be for your own farm. And that actually also means that if you can extend it by packing 
a winter fruit and then a summer fruit, you can actually get more use out of your capital expenditure. But that also means that you need a system, in our case, a robotic system that can actually very easily handle multiple items. And the third option that is really sort of because of the technology that we've developed at the center that now spins into Lyra, we can actually provide these robotic systems as a pay as you go option, which is also called a robotics as a service model where the farmer and the grower is actually just paying us like it would uh, a human laborer. And from that point of view, they don't have to have the capital expenditure and they don't have to worry about a lot of the other things that come with human labor, whether that is you know, finding, retaining, training uh, and health and safety uh, consideration for human labor. And on top of all of that, as I mentioned before, one of the really interesting aspects that we've seen really emerging over the last couple of months is the traceability aspect and the whole aspect of not having humans touching the produce while it goes through the supply chain. I want to talk a bit more about like how we, we approach this as a tech transfer problem because we are academics, we are researchers, but a lot of the times actually it is not coming research driving a product and turning that into solving a problem is usually it's the other way around, right? You start with a problem. There's a problem out there. In this case, more than two thirds of the farmers are reporting that they leave produce to rot on the field because they can't find the labor to process it. And that means to pick it, pack it, sort it, wash it. And that is really the big problem that we're trying to solve. So we, we really took the step coming in from that end and not the research end, but understand what the problem is and what kind of product we can build right now that helps farmers and growers right now and not in five years time. And so we designed the robotic system that I mentioned before, and it's really sort of stemming in the research that we built. But again, it is sort of the other way around as an academic, you tend to sometimes think of like your research and turning that into tech, um, into a product, but it's actually sometimes better to think the other way around. And, and sort of that is really, I guess, one of the core lessons learned that, I, that I'd like to, to, to tell everybody who's potentially interested in, in turning their research ideas into products. It's like, you know, see it from the other point of view. It's, it's quite interesting and it's a very good exercise um, that, that also, you know, gives you a lot more to talk with with your potential customers. As I mentioned before, we are spin out from the Australian Center for Robotic Vision, and it's really like more or less a decade of, of work that we've done on, on the three aspects that we call the brain, the eyes, and the hands. The brain is really lots of modules that deal with flexible decision-making, whether that's machine learning, whether it's genetic programming, whether that's deep learning. In the end, they are all some sort of optimization AI techniques that allow us to facilitate using the same robotic system in different industries, in different tasks, and use the information from each deployment to improve our robotic system. So for example, in agriculture, one of the clearly big issues is that compared to like industrial robotic applications, that two pieces of produce, like right, you know, two avocados, two mangoes, uh, two bananas coming through are not gonna look exactly the same. And that is a big problem for robotic systems. And at least it was a big robotic system problem until maybe like you know a couple of years ago. And that brain that learns and makes those decisions about like how to pick it up and how to place it is really one of the core capabilities that I only sort of started developing over the last you know, three, maybe four years. And that really allows us now as a company to deploy these robotic systems in a, in a, in a broader scale. As I mentioned, that sort of ties in with the vision system and the eyes. As I mentioned, you know, Center was really focused on creating robotic systems that can see, which means systems that understand the world around them. And um, the idea behind that one was that again, we built different modules that can deal with different camera systems, that can deal with different vision systems, uh, whether they are pre-trained, uh, handcrafted, or learned. In the end, it really doesn't matter. But can we build a system that actually allows us to recognize a wide number of items, decides how to pick them purely based on visual information? Again, because we might not know exactly the shape of the item that we're picking up, or because it's even a deformable object. And that's even more tricky to pick up as, as the people in, in research probably know, because it's been a, a long research problem that we're trying to solve. And the third and also very critical aspect is the hands. How do we actually interact safely with the object, whether that is a vacuum suction, 
a two finger uh, pinch grasper or do we need something that's almost like a human hand that has multiple digits that can safely you know close an object and so we've done some work on, on designing and building these robotic systems uh, sorry the grasping system also on the, on the physical mechanical side of things and and our robot that Rodrigo already mentioned we won the Amazon challenge in 2017 in that robotic system we have developed our own gripping system, which took about six months to just design and, and develop. And we designed about 30 different variants of that system. And that's really sort of something that we can do right now because rapid prototyping, 3D printing really allows us to build different hands, put them on a robotic system, you know, 3D print them, you know, wait a day, put them on a robotic system, test them, and then run the whole cycle again. And that really allows us to, to optimize for things that Previously, we, we couldn't really do because it's one shot um, mechanical system design where if you don't want to, well, if you want to change it later, you don't want to spend a lot of time and money on it. And, and that's sort of like the, the two aspects that sort of are contradicting each other. As Rodrigo said, we won the Amazon Robotics Challenge. And that's for me was really sort of the master where the center, the center for robotic vision um, for me, it sort of transitioned into, into a startup because we've done a lot of fundamental research, building these modules, writing papers, having academic impact. But for the challenge itself, which was an order fulfillment challenge, which was based on, on the Amazon you know, system where you have already systems that drive shelves around, but then you need a robotic system to look into the shelf, to pick the right thing out of the shelf and place it in a cardboard box. So if you, for example, order a Harry Potter DVD, you get a Harry Potter DVD and not a Mean Girls DVD. Or if you order a pair of socks, you should get a pair of socks, not a Harry Potter DVD, right? So that really was the challenge in 2017. And we needed to build a full robotic system for that. And we decided to design the whole system from scratch. And our system scored 17% better than the second place team. And it costs uh, more than five times less than the second place team. And that was not even the most expensive robotic system that was brought there. And we competed against you know, world leading research labs, such as MIT, Princeton, uh, University of Bonn in Germany, which is very active in, in competitions, but also Panasonic, uh, Mitsubishi and, and Toshiba, like uh, bigger corporates. And for me, as I said, this is sort of really the point where, where I started to realize that the work that we've done on the fundamental side, uh, the academic side, the research side, the paper writing side can be translated into a product or an instantiation that might turn into a product and really have an impact outside of academia and help people, help society and help industry. And that was really sort of the kernel that started our, our discussion about um, how to, to turn that into into, into a company. But just before that, this is actually the robotic system that we built. Uh, we called it Cartman for Cartesian Manipulator. It is um, a one-off built robotic system by between, you know, I guess between the students and the postdoc, there was like 17 of us. Uh, we built it in six months time, as I mentioned before. Don't look too close at this picture. You can see a lot of cabling and a lot of weird um, engineering, but this never had to be a product, right? It just needed to run in Japan at RoboCup in 2017. And, and if you're interested, I'm, I'm more than happy to tell some of the stories and around that as well. But the whole idea was, this is a very cheap and functional robotic system really designed for that specific use case. And we have a lot of modular AI computer vision systems that we can now use and stick onto this robotic system that allows us to test them and allows us to quickly deploy them and quickly see which things are working, which, which things are not working. What you can also see, there's actually a secondary camera right in front on, on, the, on the top pole there uh, on the aluminum extrusion. And that is was quite interesting for the specific use case there. And again, happy to, if, if there's a question around that, to, to go into that as well. But the, the core idea was we, we can, could build a robotic system very quickly and we could test it out and we can compete against in industrial robotic systems that are a lot more expensive and a lot more precise. But the point is, if we don't know what we're actually picking up, precision is not the critical issue. Understanding and the AI and the vision system, that is the critical issue. And that really sort of, as I mentioned before, turned into, into our um, 
uh, our startup and into our product. And really, th that's a journey, right? Like uh, transferring technology out of a university into a product is a journey by itself. Um, and and you know, again, as I said before, it takes some some rethinking and remodeling of of what you want to do. Our journey started with what I call the brain, the eyes and the hands. As I mentioned before, we built lots of different small modules that by themselves would be good enough for writing a paper or good enough for you know, showcasing a proof of concept on the vision side or the AI side of things, but it weren't really an integrated product until Cartman. At Lyra, we took that and took that the next step and understand what would a product need to have to actually be commercially viable, to be reliable and to perform the task that is actually required of. And so in the middle, that's the design. And on the very right-hand side, you can see the actual robotic system that we are now uh, deploying in, in packing sheds. So you can see the journey there, and it is really a journey, right? It's not something that starts you know, um, with, with you know, a great idea in mind and you arrive at exactly what you want it to be, right? It, it, it takes a bit of back and forth and a bit of, you know, windy road to understand what actually the best ways of deploying these robotic systems are. And I, I mentioned before the, the brain, the eyes and the hands, and, and obviously the, these were research terms about the modules that I mentioned before, but now as a company, we actually needed to understand how we can tell our customers what, what Lyra is actually doing. And that's what we call Lyra machine intelligence, which basically enables any robotic system to become an advanced robotic picking packing solution. And that is really the software that combines the computer vision approaches, the, the images that come out of camera system or other sensory systems and understands how to then tell the robotic system how to perform these tasks. The other interesting aspect of that system is actually that we, uh, deployed that on lots of different robots, not just our own robotic systems, the, the render and the image of the, the white box that I showed before, that is a Lyra robot, but we can put that on industrial robotic systems. We can put that on partner robotic systems. And on the bottom there, you can see, we can even put them on vacuum suction, fingered graspers. We can use fresh produce or e-commerce items. We're basically the same technology stack with the same core Lyra machine intelligence with some, just some added modules specifically for the items that we want to pick or specifically a gripper that we're using in the specific instantiation. And the core features again are something that is from an academic point of view, something that you need to rethink, right? And in, in academia, it, it depends about your, your maths and your, your understanding and your experimentation about a certain feature of an algorithm for a customer. Most, most people don't particularly care what the technology is that is sticking underneath it, but what is it that you can actually do them? So their features are, you know, I can precisely place an object after I picked it up. I can find what is the best possible grasp point on an object, depending on, you know, squishability or like bruising as well as visual inspection, or even if I want to rotate the object afterwards, what is the best place to actually pick it up so it don't take the, the longest amount of time. And thirdly, like quality assurance. I can, I can weigh the item, I can scan the item, I have visual information, I can do another quality check. And that's really sort of something that is something that we recently see as, as, as a core uh, added value to our customers is that we can actually understand what is going through the packing shed not just what is being put in and what comes out, but at where we are in the middle. And that is really something from a quality assurance and traceability point of view, very crucial right now. And something that, that we see a lot of positive feedback around. So Lyra Machine Intelligence is, as I said, sort of like our, our core software stack that sits in the middle. And that's sort of what we have developed over the last 12 months together with the robotic system. But as I mentioned before, we've developed that to be useful on lots of other robotic systems as well. And why is that important? Well, because the different application areas that we foresee, whether that is, you know, applications in the packing shed, which is, you know, post-harvest, we might use, depending on the produce that we are packing, something like our own robotic system or a heavy industrial arm if you're picking up, you know, like watermelons that are like seven kilos or, or five kilos heavy. So a certain flexibility needs to be in there 
if we can scale this up. And again, I want to remind everybody, the idea is we want to scale this up, right? We don't want to just deploy two robotic systems. Two robotic systems are not going to solve the labor shortage problems. That's why we need hundreds or hundred thousands of these robotic systems out there to really help out. And that's why it needs to be scalable and broadly applicable. So we have tried this with five different robots by three different companies. We've packed more than 5,000 items. We've established partnerships, both in the agriculture field and the technology field. And we're obviously looking to, to find more of those ones. So like happy to, to see if there's interest in Chile. We talked to one or two agricultural uh, machinery distributors that sort of reached out to us. Um, and, and we're definitely interested to, to deploy our robotic systems globally. Right now, we're obviously somewhat restricted in, in COVID travel uh, restriction terms, but we're more than interested to see how, how this can be done on a global scale. And the other thing is we are very accurate. Um, obviously, we are a robotic system, we are a computer vision system, so we can always use that as a secondary feedback or a third feedback. And it turns out humans are not very accurate. And it turns also out that humans vary during the whole day, right? There's a lot of fluctuation, whether you are at the beginning of the day and still motivated, or if it's just before lunch break and you're feeling already very tired, the throughput and the accuracy is really going down. So something that is reliable and more or less consistent throughout the day, that is really something that is of value to the packing shed operators, to the growers, to the farmers. And I think the other really critical aspect of the Lyra machine intelligence is that we can very quickly define new tasks. And that sort of fell out of the work that we did with those different um, verticals or different application areas, however you want to call them. Because order fulfillment is slightly different from kitting, which is slightly different from bed and packing. We need to come up with a system where, again, we have modular approaches and different modules for different tasks that can, can join easily together. And right now we're in a stage where within like 10 minutes, we can come up with a new task or you know, implement a new task. If we have a farmer on the phone asking us whether we can do a certain specific packing that you're doing, whether that is a specific pattern or a specific fruit. So we're doing virtual demos right now um, because it's, it's you know, COVID time. So everything is over soon. So you can actually call in into our robotic system and we show you what is going on. And basically you can say, well, actually I would like to pick, you know, punnets of cherry tomatoes today. And we can fix it up in, in about 10 minutes time, which is really something quite different from, from academic research and quite different than how you, you know, run demos in, in academia, which, which is very exciting to see for me as, a, as, a, as an academic um, or former academic now, now working in industry. <clears throat> the other aspect, and I brought it up a few times already is, how do you design these robotic systems so they're scalable? Again, one or two robotic systems are not going to solve the problem, right? And, and just to, again, remind, in Australia alone, there's 26,000 jobs missing right now. So one core idea was, obviously, you know, software as a service is very scalable, and people have, have shown that this works um, for, for business, uh, you know, product market fit and, and business model point of view in the past. But how can we use similar technologies for robotic systems. And on, on the software side, that's relatively easy. There's virtualization that you can do. You can you know, partly run things in the cloud. You can do inference on, on embedded systems. So you can ways where you can actually distribute the load and scale it up if necessary. That is working on the software side of things. On the hardware side of things, that's always a bit more tricky. And, and you know, as in the picture here, we really foresee that there's lots of our robotic systems working around humans and, in, and assisting humans to, to increase their throughput. So one of the core ideas also in the engineering over the last 12 months was, how can we build a robotic system that is very easy to assemble, very quick to assemble, very quick to manufacture. And so our robotic system went through about three iterations in the last nine months. And the idea again is a, a relatively cost-effective way of either putting an industrial robotic system in the middle of our brain and our casing, as you can see with the orange robot arm here, or build a lot of our robotic systems close to where they actually are deployed. And so one of the reasons why we came to, to you know, the robots as a service model as, as we see it right now is that we can actually produce our robotic systems 
close to where they're actually being used in rural Australia, for example, because it is does not require high tech manufacturing. The high tech is in the software side of things. And that's one way where we can see the scalability. The other thing that I also want to mention for, for those people that have experience building one robotic system, yes, it is hard to build one robotic system, but it's significantly easier to build one robotic system than it is to build a, you know, a thousand robotic systems. So you have to really come into it with the mindset of like, how can we simplify it as much as possible from the get-go so we understand the scale-up problem, so we understand the logistics behind it, and so we understand how to you know, improve the system and get like, as I said, scalability from day one. And that also, as I mentioned before, applies to the software side of things and rapid prototyping of, of, of things through 3D printing and, and other additive manufacturing tasks. The other in really interesting thing, and that's sort of why I asked the question before to, to the presenter from, from, uh, from Japan just a, just a couple of minutes ago, our robotic system is mainly consisting of the brain, the eyes, and the hands. If, if you ever talk about robots, you understand that these three are not what's called navigation or mobility. Right? So, and that is because we believe that these three are core to making robotic systems manipulate and interact with the world safely. And we can work and partner with people that are building mobility platforms we are not the mobility experts and we don't want to be the mobility experts, but we can provide valuable contribution to make these robotic systems smart enough to, for example, perform operations in vertical farming, whether that is the same as picking and packing in the farm or in greenhouses or even in urban agriculture, which is sort of emerging as well. And the task will be slightly different, but the technology can be very easily transferred if we see an avocado on a conveyor belt and need to understand what the quality of that avocado is, as well as understanding whether there is bruising, whether there's blushing, whether there's you know any other sort of damaging on the skin. We can one-on-one -on -one transfer that to, as depicted here, in, an, in a robotic system that can actually pick those things off the vine or off the bush. And so that's really something where I'm very excited as a roboticist because it really is a transferable technology that goes up and down the supply chain, right? Right now we're doing packing, which is sort of sits sort of in the middle between farming and harvesting and eventually like arriving on, 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 your, you know, on your plate um, or in your supermarket. But there's ways that we can expand into further in the field where we can do harvesting, pruning is another thing, can we trim back, can we de-leave operations, can we, with a tree and a bush um, in, in growing fruit and vegetable, and that was the other part of the question before, there's quite a lot of things that are still done manually, at least here in Australia, um, but also in, in other countries from, from my understanding. And we believe that we can help out there as well. It is more a question of commercial viability and that's why we're doing packing first. But I believe there's a lot of application areas where with the right partners, we can actually go in the field. We can do deployments in operations where it makes a lot of sense. And even the other way, further down the supply chain, once it is in a box, we can, the whole traceability aspect, go through a distribution, repack them, change, for example, from domestic produce to export if needed, or even in the supply chain say, okay, this is a larger box, but now it needs to get split into smaller boxes for the supermarket, or even as I mentioned at the very beginning, e-grocery as a home delivery problem where you order you know, three avocados, two bananas and a mango, and then you need to actually pick out of the three boxes the things that go into your home delivery. And that's really where, where I see like the large market space opening up for somebody like Lyra uh, or other robotics companies in that space because there's you know a billion dollar market around this, this whole supply chain, which really relies on the core principles of understanding what you're picking up, make a decision of how to pick it up, and then visually ident identifying that you actually did what you were planning on doing. As I mentioned before, we, we now have our first product ready. This is, is the final first product. Um, you, can, you can see it packing here, um, nectarines, and this is also the robotic system in our facilities where you can dial in and, and Zoom call in and then see how these operations work. 
Um, the, the black part on the left side of the robotic system is similar to that very first video in the avocado where the fruit will roll in. We can also very easily replace this with a conveyor belt. So for example, if you have a conveyor belt of fruit uh, that are already being washed uh, or have been washed before, we can make this go through the robotic system and pick from there into the boxes and then the boxes basically leave the robotic system on the other end. There's more videos of that online and I can show you a few more of the videos right here. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is broadly applicable to lots of different areas. We focus on agriculture, um, especially the last couple of months. That's really something where we see a lot of potential for agriculture deployments. And so this is uh, a rock melons on the top there. Um, I'll see if I can play that again. And that's sort of some of the heaviest items that we have. But um, there, there's some more videos online and I'm happy to share some more uh, with, with you guys if there's interesting questions. But also on the left hand side, we have uh, trial partners and, and we've trialed the robotic system, not just in agriculture and horticulture, but also in e-commerce. And for example, here you can see a sorting task in the top where the white things go into one box and the blue things go into another one, which is more like an, a returns for example, if you're a warehouse operator and you're getting shipments back from a customer because either they didn't like it or they were broken or something like this, then you still need to sort them out uh, depending on, on what you see and depending on, on what there is coming back. And so that's the first task there. And the second one at the bottom is your, your more standard uh, you know, picking task where you have a box of, of random objects and the customer ordered, for example, the, um, in this case, I think the, the coffee beans and you want to place them in the cardboard box. And again, you want to place them so that you're optimizing the space in which you place them in. Right? So this is not just placing them randomly. And then we all end up with the Amazon boxes that are very large and with very few items in there. So can you optimize the placement is, is another benefit of a robotic system that sort of, if you already have a warehouse management system ties in a lot better than a human, which needs to read you know, from a screen or its own skill, understand how many boxes do they need to put all these items in. All right, um, I guess, I'll leave it here. I'm more than happy to take any questions. So feel free to ask a lot of questions. Um, I think we have we have a couple of minutes, uh, 20 minutes almost time. So if you don't have that many questions, I guess Rodrigo might have something else to do. But like, thank you for having me and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Right